Well, Merry Christmas. It's great to see you guys all here at Mosaic today. And I thought we would begin today with a little word quiz. I don't know about you, but when I see a new word that I'm not familiar with, I try to figure out and guess the meaning of it before I know what the meaning is to see if I can guess right. So I thought we'd play that little game today. So the first word I have for you is phonesia, which is a real word. I thought it was a noun referring to the act of forgetting where you put your phone on a regular basis. You know that person. But the real... <laughs> I am that person. But the real definition is the act of dialing a phone number and forgetting whom you are calling just as they answer. (laughs) So the next time you call someone, they say, hello, and you say, who is this? And they say, I don't know. You called me. You just say, oh, I'm sorry, just a case of phonesia. The next word is disconfect. Uh, This is a verb that is the attempt to sterilize the piece of candy you dropped on the floor by blowing on it. Another is blamestorming. This one's used in the corporate world. It means sitting in a group and discussing who's responsible for the company's problems rather than trying to solve them. Another is intoxication, which is the euphoria from getting a tax refund, which lasts until you realize it was your money to begin with. <laughs> so I hope you find a way you can use those. <laughs> Those words get our attention because they're new or unfamiliar with them, but what often gets overlooked is words that we come across more often that we think we know the meaning of, and sometimes we just take their meaning for granted and move on. So here's another one, joy. A word we hear at Christmas a lot is joy. We sing joy to the world. We see joy on Christmas cards, but what is joy? In fact, in the first Christmas story in the Bible, we're going to read it in a moment, the Uh, after Jesus is born, angels appear to shepherds nearby and say, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Now, before I go on and talk about joy, I have to hang on that phrase, good news, because I have some good news for you. Mosaic, about a year and a half ago, bought a building that was going to be our future home because, as you can tell, we need more space. And this fall, and by the way, you can see pictures of what it's going to look like at at that TV showing pictures in the lobby. This fall, we needed to raise some money so we could begin renovations. We had a goal of $2 million, and the people of Mosaic committed to give over $2.7 million to renovate that building. Yeah, you can clap for that. That's not the good news I was going to share. That's just the new people clapping because they came afterwards and they don't have to give to it. But, (laughs) But the really good news I have is we started construction. And that is awesome. And so this week, they gave us some sledgehammers. <laughs> Be quiet. They, uh, let me take out my ingression. Some, some you know, organizations get in suits and have gold shovels are groundbreaking with sledgehammers and jeans. And it was totally awesome. So bottom line, construction's happening. They tell me it's going to take less than a year. That's rolling. It's awesome because we didn't know when it was going to start, and it's getting started already. So if you are one of the people who comes to Mosaic only on Christmas... I bring this up to let you know if you show up here next year, you will be alone. We will be in our new home, which will be much more beautiful. You'll want to join us there. See you then. Now, that's good news. But in the grand scheme of Christmas, I was thinking, what is joy? And I thought, you know, the thing, a thing we talk a lot about at Christmas is presents. Right? We're getting presents. And, and kind of my definition of a good present is the present that just gives a lot of of joy. What brings the most joyful reaction? That's a good present. Which, by the way, I hope even just talking about presents doesn't stress you out. I know there's different things that stress people out at Christmas. I don't know if you saw this letter that went around the news. A six-year-old for her school was required to write a letter to Santa, and this went viral. It says, Dear Santa, I'm only doing this for the class. I know your naughty list is empty, and your good list is empty, and your life is empty. You don't know the trouble I've had in my life. Goodbye. <laughs> And then it says at the bottom, signature, I'm not telling you. (laughs) Which I like the wreaths on the one side and then the skulls on the other. Like, I'm coming for you, old man. (laughs) But we're always looking for that perfect present that'll bring joy. So it's interesting that in the first Christmas story, the good news was that there was great joy. Because for a lot of reasons, we could use some joy this Christmas. You've got that drama in your life that won't go away, or Christmas is a reminder of how crazy messed up your finances are, or everybody looks great on the Christmas card you sent out, you just wish that's how it was every day in real life, or maybe things are going fine, you just realize something's missing, and you think, I could really use some good news of great joy this Christmas. So what I want to do for the next few minutes is I want to walk us through the first Christmas story 
And I want to use this idea of a present and kind of imagine what could be in this for you that would bring you great joy this Christmas. Here's how the story starts. It was written by a doctor named Luke, and he wrote one of the four biographies of Jesus we have in the Bible. It says, at that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, a lot of names here. It's simply reminding us this happened to real people at a real place at a real time in history. See, the Christmas story does not start once upon a time. It happened at a real place at a real time with real people. Listen, when you follow Jesus, you don't check your brain at the door. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with your mind. We don't love Jesus in spite of our brains. We love Jesus because of our brains. It goes on, all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. Now, I'll connect this in a second, but maybe what would be in this present for some of you is something representing fun. And so maybe the thing that would give you joy this Christmas is plane tickets to your favorite vacation spot, Maybe it's the latest video game. Maybe it would be keys to a classic car you could uh, fix up and drive around, or maybe just a bunch of alcohol. Whatever your definition is, that's what a lot of us want. We say, my life is so stressful, I just want a good time. And frankly, Christmas adds to the stress a lot, which I just have to tell you, in all seriousness, I have figured out this Christmas a great way to shop. I never thought I would say that. I hate shopping. But three weeks ago, this is no lie, Three weeks ago, my wife and I went out on a date. We went to a Mexican restaurant. We ordered a pitcher of margaritas. We watched Monday Night Football. We got out our phones, and we spent $200 online, and we went home, and we were done. It was awesome. (laughs) Those are the men clapping. (laughs) But what we think is, I need some fun. I need that next drink, next vacation, next hit, next good time, because I'm stressed or overworked or just have life happening right now. So if someone could say, you could have a fun time, that would be some really good news that would honestly bring you some joy right about now. But look at what we just read. And so they went from Nazareth to Bethlehem. That's 90 miles. And the Christmas card pictures you've seen are probably accurate. Joseph probably walked. Mary probably rode a donkey. Listen, when my wife was getting ready to have a kid, I didn't want to drive five miles. They're walking 90 miles. This was not fun. Verse 5, he took with them Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. The thing this made me think of is that for some of you, what would be in this present would be something representing good health. And I thought of that because she's going into labor. That's a stressful time. We have four kids. So I remember my wife's labor like it was yesterday. It was new. It was intense. It was painful. And by the way, when I'm I'm talking about something bringing, uh, representing good health, I'm not talking, here's another new word, to the cyberchondriacs in the room. Have you seen this word? This is a real word in medical literature. It refers to someone who spends so much time researching health symptoms online, they think every pain is cancer and every headache is a brain tumor. You know this person, right? You're elbowing them right now. (laughs) I was talking with a friend of mine this week about this word, and he goes, oh yeah, the WebMD emails. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. What, What do you mean? And apparently my friend at some point had given his email address to that website, WebMD. So now he gets daily and even sometimes more frequent emails than that. And he started reading me the titles. I said, slow down. I have to share these in my sermon. Here are some of the emails I got just in the last week. Top causes of liver damage. 13 shockingly salty foods. Nine scalp issues you shouldn't brush off. 14 conditions that can hurt your sex life. Eyelid, lumps and bumps. Are they serious? And I was laughing. I said, you can't unsubscribe, though, can you? He goes, I can't. I can't unsubscribe. <laughs> but for the non cyberchondriacs in the room, what, what would bring some of you joy is something representing good health, right? It would be that the blood work is clean or the infertility has been solved or just some kind of result showing it's actually going to be okay. And for many, good health seems like it would be good news of great joy because it seems like your life is consumed with health issues. But when you read the scripture, even though they went through childbirth, good health wasn't the good news that brought good, great joy. Verse 7, she gave birth to her firstborn son, Jesus, 
She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger. Now, immediately, if I'm Joseph, I'm thinking about money. I mean, those of you who are new parents know when you have a kid, there's some expensive stuff you got to buy out there. And I think up until this point, they hadn't thought about money because they were traveling. They got to get a place to stay. You're helping in childbirth. Then when everything settled down, Mary says, uh, so where can we put the baby? And Joseph says, I guess um, the feeding trough. And she goes, okay, do it. And Joseph has to stare at the baby in a feeding trough. And if he's like most of us men, he's thinking a real man would have been able to provide something better than that. And so for a lot of us, the present that would give us joy is money. We could just use some money. My oldest uh, kid is only 10 years old, um, but it already happened this year. And by it happened, I mean multiple, multiple of our kids, when we asked what they wanted for Christmas, replied, cash. I said, listen, Santa don't give cash. Mom and dad don't give cash. Grandma and grandpa don't bring cash. You're going to get something you don't like and return it for cash like the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd want money for different things, right? Times are tight, paying the bills, or maybe the debt's mounting and you're not sure how to get out. Maybe Chris is just a general reminder of what you don't have. And we think, if I just had a little bit more, I'd be good. But you know what? That's not true. Because I've looked at study after study done in the United States, and in the United States, it does not matter what income bracket or you, you are in, what it would take to make you content, not rich, but content, is 20% more. It's across the board. If you make $30,000 or $300,000, it doesn't matter. You say, well, if I just had 20% more, I'd be good. So what that tells me is you'll never have enough. And in the first Christmas, they had good news of great joy, but it wasn't money. They were poor. Story goes on, she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him snugly in cloths, and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Now, this can be misleading for us because when we read that, we think Joseph was just some dummy who forgot to make a hotel reservation, so they had to go knock a door to door, nowhere had any room, so somebody out of the generosity of their heart said, well, I guess you can stay in this barn, and that's how it went down. That's not how it went down. See, remember what we already read, everybody went to their hometown to register for this census. So they went to where Joseph's family was. And houses in that day was typically one building divided into essentially two parts. There was one part that was the living quarters for humans and one part that was the living quarter for animals. So what most scholars believe is that Joseph's family had heard the story of the quote-unquote virgin birth. She's pregnant, but she's a virgin. And they're like, uh-huh, that's not how that works, Joseph. You've been duped. So most scholars believe that when Joseph and Mary show up to Joseph's family house, they say, um, it's nice to meet you. You can sleep in the barn. So what's going on here isn't no room at the Hampton Inn. Instead, it's her in-laws won't let her in the house. Somebody said the first Christmas was an awkward family gathering, so we've been celebrating that way ever since. <laughs> But for a lot of us, the present that would bring great joy would be some kind of relational or even family news, right? I mean, for some of you, it would be a wedding ring because you're just ready for that part of your life to get here, which I did learn, ladies, that December 24th is the most popular day of the year to propose. So if you're holding hands with him right now and his palm is sweating, that may be really good news for you. <laughs> and if he doesn't, I just made a really awkward conversation later. But... <laughs> For some of you, it would be something representing a healthy marriage. Because you used to be in love. He used to buy flowers. She used to respect you. He used to listen. She used to initiate sex. But instead of passion and romance and enjoying each other, just putting up with each other and praying she doesn't tick you off. So when you see this, you long for the days when you were in love and everything was perfect and easy. And if you could just have that again, that'd, that'd be good news. But as it is, you're stuck with him, you're stuck with her, and you're not excited at all. But think about Mary. My guess is this isn't how she wanted to start. I think she wanted to be on her honeymoon in some exotic location where people are bringing her endless fruity drinks with little umbrellas in them. Instead, she's not married. They've never been intimate. They've got to take care of a baby. And the family says, you're not allowed in our house. So family was not the thing that brought great joy. Verse 8, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. It goes on to say, angels appear to them and say, the Son of God, Jesus, has been born. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. 
Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. Now again, on a Christmas card, this looks so great. I mean, just picture it. You've seen it. You've got Mary and Joseph looking so holy and happy. You've got the baby Jesus with just this holy glow about him, and you have some shepherds just gathered around to complete the scene. But think about this. Mary's just been in labor. She's exhausted. No epidural, by the way. They're in a barn. Right when they settle down, and in my imagination, which I think is probably accurate, right when Jesus falls asleep, there's a loud knock on the door. Joseph doesn't know what's going on. He opens, and there is some shepherds. And shepherds were the outcasts of society. They were probably teenagers. They were poor. They were dirty. And the only people who come to visit Jesus at his birth are some outcast stranger shepherds. So if I'm Mary or Joseph, I'm looking at this scene not like some cute, beautiful thing on your nativity set. I'm thinking, this is the impact we're having I'm giving up the beginning of my marriage. Our life is put on hold. And this baby that's supposed to change the world, the only visitors we get are some stinky shepherds. I think a lot of us can relate. For a lot of us, what would be in this present is something to know we're making an impact. We go through the same routine every day. We don't see any results. Or you just had a big life change. Maybe you had a baby. Maybe you changed jobs and it seems your impact is nothing. Or we're doing something that everybody tells us is supposed to be making an impact, like raising kids or something similar, but it sure doesn't seem like it's doing much. And you want your life to matter. You want to be part of something great. So if you could open a present this Christmas that brought joy, it would say, you are changing the world. As it is, you kind of feel like Mary and Joseph. Like the only people we're impacting is these strange shepherds who are in our barn right after we had a baby. But look at our theme verse again. The angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. So what is it? What's this good news? Here it is. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today. Now I know what you're thinking. (laughs) You're thinking, wait, 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 wait. I want to be married and have a good time, and I need to make an impact, and I just want to have something fun in my life, and the good news is I have a Savior? Yay. (laughs) Let me explain. The word Messiah simply means sent from God. Lord and Savior mean leader and forgiver. What that means is Jesus gives grace and truth. See, here's how the Christmas story fits into the story of humanity and into your personal story. God created the universe from nothing. When he created humans, he said, this is very good. The problem is we want to be in charge. So we go against what we know is right, what God tells us is best for us, and that disconnects us from God. It leaves a brokenness and an emptiness inside of us. But God was not content with that. So the story of Christmas is God breaking into his creation with the birth of his son, Jesus. Jesus would grow up to die on a cross and take your sin on him, and he places his perfection on you. So after you accept Jesus, when God the Father looks at you, he does not see the shameful things of your past. He sees perfection and holiness and purity, and that's called grace. Grace means there's nothing you can do to make God love you anymore, and there is nothing you can do to make God love you less. The way we say it around here is endless second chances. When I'm finished, we're going to see some people get baptized, which is simply the action Jesus tells you to take when you're ready to accept grace. And when I'm finished, we're going to celebrate communion. If you're new with us, we're going to pass a tray down your row with stacks of cups on it, cracker in one, juice in the other, representing the body and blood of Jesus. Our band's going to play some quiet music. We're going to put a verse on the screen. We want you to take a stack of cups and eat and drink that to have a moment of reflection. And it's a chance for those who follow Jesus to be reminded, I have endless second chances. It's also a moment for those of you who don't follow Jesus to ask, how am I going to get joy? Because here's what I know about your life. There are a lot of different things that we think, if I just had that, then I'd have some joy. And they're good things. Money used well is a good thing. Good health is a good thing. But we think these things will give us ultimate fulfillment and a joy that will never go away. They won't. You give money, you're going to want more. 
You have good health, you're still going to die one day. You have a good time this weekend, you'll be bored again next weekend. And we end up being like a toddler with one of those shaped toys. And we have the circle piece trying to fit it in the square hole over and over. And it doesn't fit. And we can get frustrated watching a two-year-old do that. The problem is I've seen a 22-year-old do the same thing. I've seen a 52-year-old do the same thing. Because we say, maybe this marriage, maybe a different marriage, maybe a different lover, maybe having a kid, maybe a different gender, maybe a different career, maybe this toy, maybe this relationship, maybe this prescription will make me good. And we try to fill the hole in our hearts with all kinds of different things. But the Christmas story says what you've been looking for is joy, and you're trying to fill a deeper need that only God can fill. I heard a public speaker one time give advice on how you can be happy. And I thought what he said was pretty good. I want to share it with you. He said, we go through life so often saying the phrase, it could be better. And we may not say it out loud. We may not even think those exact words, but that's what we feel. That's how we act when we compare our relationships or our stuff or our experience to other people. We think and act as if it could be better. But the speaker I was listening to suggested that the key to living a happier life is a different phrase, it could be worse. In fact, I want you to get this ingrained in you, so I'm going to have you say it out loud. Now, I need you to do better than every other service has done it, because some have been a little sleepy, but it's getting in the afternoon. I know you're getting more energy because Christmas is closer. So one, two, three, go. It could be worse. Oh, you are the best. Good job. (laughs) So I want you to get this in your mind and start using this. So for example, when you leave today, you're going to go to your car, and typically you would be annoyed with it and what's broken or what's old and think of your friend who has a nicer car, your neighbor has a more expensive car, but you're not going to do that today. You're going to think of how you could have broken down on the side of the highway and not have a car that would have even gotten you to church. And you're going to say with great enthusiasm, when you get home to your apartment or your house, you're going to be tempted to just like normal think of a bigger apartment or a nicer house that you've seen on HGTV with all the finishings, but you're not going to do that. You're going to see the stain on the carpet, you're going to hear the squeaky door, and you're going to be excited about what you have, and you're going to say out loud, tomorrow morning when you wake up and roll over and look at your spouse, you're going to, no, don't say it. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> And I'm making a joke, but I think there's some wisdom there because that's just a different way of saying recognize what you already have. Sometimes we spend more time praying for another kid than thanking for the, God for the kid we do have. Or we dream of the impact we'll make when this season is over instead of finding joy in the impact we're making right now. Or we think good health is what we need when God is trying to communicate you are learning to depend on me more right now than you would in any other circumstance. So I have just come to believe we need to recognize what we already have. And this is personal for me. This year, I've really tried to focus on the word joy. And way back at the beginning of the year, I learned something that really helped me. Because some well-intentioned Christians throughout my life have tried to explain joy by saying happiness and joy are two different things. Happiness is an emotion, joy is a deep-rooted reality, and happiness is based on circumstance, whereas joy is based on Jesus. And that sounds fine until you read the Bible. Because when I studied the Bible, I found out happiness and joy in the Bible are the same thing. It's the same word. That's good news because Scripture also says part of the fruit of knowing God is joy. Part of the fruit of knowing God is happiness. So this year, I've really tried to focus on joy because I'm not typically known as a happy person. Maybe that makes me a bad pastor. I'm not sure. In fact, when I hang out with other pastors, i got to tell you this, I just get really uncomfortable because most of them are all extroverts. They can't stop talking to other people. They wear khakis all the time, and they smile nonstop. I am an introvert. I don't smile, and I don't own khakis. The reality, <laughs> but the reality is this. I look look at a lot of genuinely joyful Christians, and I often feel I can't relate because my mind goes to dark places. I'm anxious a lot. I worry constantly. Sometimes I'll make up scenarios in my head, and then 
emotionally react to them as if they've already happened, and then I'll have to recover emotionally from the scenario that has only happened in my head. Or I'll stand on this stage and talk about how God will deal with your past, and he has dealt with mine, but in moments of emotion, I find myself reacting to others I care about in ways that I know stem from my past, and I end up hurting them because I'm being manipulative or just flat out rude, and I wish God would just change me already. And I've realized the thing I need is joy. And if you're with me, I hope you're here in February because we're going to do a whole series in joy. But the main thing I've learned this year is there's no secret. It's just a question of am I going to embrace what is already mine in Jesus? Here's the thing about a present. I can give you a present, but if you don't open it, you don't enjoy it. Like until you open this, it's not really yours. And so I've realized that we have three different groups today, I think, that need to open a present. One group of you is brand new to all this, and you're bumping into Jesus for maybe the very first time, and church is a whole new experience for you, and you're thinking, why is there smoke in here? What is on fire? And I didn't know pastors were so good looking. And the (laughs) And the gift to you is an invitation back. We want you to know this is a safe place for you to bump into Jesus, to walk alongside people who have your same struggles and figure out what it means to walk in his grace and truth. But there's a second group of you who, to be frank, need to give your life to Jesus, and you need to do it today. And maybe you had faith once upon a time. Maybe you were even part of church once upon a time. Maybe not. But you find yourself here in this room on Christmas Eve, And you know, you know you need joy. And the reason you know it is because you've looked everywhere else for it and you're still missing something. And you know that Jesus is calling to you. You know he's saying, make me your leader. Make me your your forgiver. And I'll give you grace I'll give you truth, I'll help you deal with your past, and I'll give you joy. And if you know that, don't put him off. Open the present. Check the box about baptism on your connection card, because our staff would love to follow up with you in the coming weeks and unpack what it means to follow Jesus. But there's a third group of you. And it's those of you who follow Jesus. Jesus is the most important thing in your life. The biggest lesson I've learned this year is I have to live in what I already have. So my question to the Christians is, will you walk in the joy that is already yours? Joy doesn't mean you don't have pain or you never doubt or relationships are easy. It simply means those things don't define your status or your mood. Jesus does. Christians, let me remind you what you believe. Jesus didn't just die on the cross. He rose from the grave proving you could trust him. I know you had a miscarriage, but Jesus said, I'm with you always, so you have joy. You're still single, but the Lord is with you, so you have joy. A family member refuses contact, but the joy of the Lord is your strength. You can't get pregnant, but your joy isn't contingent on that. You carry the past inside you, but he said, my words will give you joy. You have questions about work, and your marriage is in a rough spot, and you feel so alone. And some of you are facing another treatment, and others of you worries to no end. And the mental illness seems crippling, and so many of us are just so tired. But Jesus said, I will give rest to your souls, and your joy will be complete. The reason I need Jesus The reason I desperately, daily hang on to Jesus is I want and I need joy. And Christmas means I have it. So I have good news of great joy. A Savior's been born.
He will offer you endless second chances. He will ground you in truth. And no matter what you're facing, you can have a joy, even a happiness that nothing can take away from you. That is the gift of Christmas. So we can say joy to the world. The Lord has come. He rules the world with truth and grace. So let earth receive her king. Let's pray. Jesus, as we enter communion, we are reminded of your love and grace. And I pray for these three groups. I pray that the people who are brand new will come back to keep bumping into Jesus. They'll come and see. God, I pray for the person that you are speaking to in their seat, and they know, they know you want them to take that final step and say, I'm all in, Jesus. I pray they'll respond. And God, I pray for the Christians who come here with all kinds of worries or baggage or just things going on, big and small. I pray that they'll walk, we'll walk out of here with joy, knowing that's the message of Christmas. Thank you for joy. We love you, Jesus. It is in your name we pray. Amen.